If you have God's book, open up with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9 is the location that we are going to visit in our sermon this morning. Now, Siri is a thorn in my side, and when I sent my sermon titles to Brother Stan, she seemed to correct my sermon title. Maybe she didn't like my sermon title, but she changed that sermon title from Out of Low Debar to Out of All Debar, and everybody thinks it's a foreign language. But I promise that it's a place, and we're going to see what that place is this morning in our lesson. You see, I came to tell you a story. I came to tell you a story about a man who was the son of a prince. I came to tell you a story about a man who became lame at a very young age. This was a man who was the son of a prince, the grandson of a king. His family members were friends of the king. In fact, in any other kingdom, he would have been king, for he was the rightful heir to the throne, to sit upon the throne of that kingdom. But you see, his kingdom was not really his kingdom. And therefore, his kingdom was taken out of his hands by divine origins. He became an outcast. He was poor. He was wretched. He was culturally destined to live a life of, of poverty and, and loneliness until his death. And that is, until one day, a king who was friends with his father... Asked the question, is there not still one of the house of Saul that I can show the kindness of God? And the fact of the matter is, Mephibosheth didn't deserve the kindness of God. It wasn't something that he had earned in his life. He was living as an outcast in a place of desolation. Mephibosheth was a man who... He had lost everything that he ever had from the lust palaces of the king to now he's living in another man's house. But when David asked that question, is there not still one of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God? In that moment of time, the life of Mephibosheth changed forever. You see, if you were to go back in your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 4, and we were to start there in verse 4, we would find the story of Mephibosheth. Now, he was a very young man when his grandfather and his father both were killed on Mount Geboah. And the people heard of their death, and so they were a little bit afraid. You see, he was the only one that was left as a descendant, and so the nurse that was taking care of him probably thought that he was next, that the enemies of his grandfather and his father would come and, and they would kill him to end any heir to the throne. And so she decided that she was going to run in haste. And so she picked him up. And as she was running away, the Bible tells us that she, she dropped Mephibosheth. And he became lame for the rest of his life. After 2 Samuel chapter 4, you won't hear of Mephibosheth again until 2 Samuel chapter 9. But when you're talking about the story of Mephibosheth, this is important. It's really a story that can be summed up in three key words. Number one, the story of Mephibosheth is a story of promise. You see, the question that David asked in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 3, is there not still one of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God? That question came from a promise that David had made to the father of Mephibosheth. We know him as Jonathan. In fact, the Bible tells us that Jonathan and David were the best of friends. In fact, they loved each other more than their own soul, and they made a covenant. And in the moment of time when David was asking that question, he was remembering the promise that he had made to his best friend so many years ago. And he wanted to show the kindness of God to one who was of Jonathan. The second word is, it's a story of injury. I mean, here is a man who, by no fault of his own, was dropped at a very young age, and as a result, he became lame the rest of his life. He was injured by, not himself, but by someone else. And the fact of the matter is, I would imagine that we could all say that we've been injured by, by someone in our life. 
We've been injured by friends. We've been injured by family members. We've been injured by parents. We've been crippled by their devastating actions. I would imagine that would even extend into situations. People have been crippled by job loss, by career setback. They've been crippled by troubling health problems that they're dealing with and that they're having to go through on a daily basis. We've all been injured. Mephibosheth was injured. But the third word is this. This is important. It's a story of grace. David says, is there not still someone? Now that's an important question, but if I was going to say the most important word in that question, it would be someone. Because notice David didn't say, is there not someone who deserves the kindness of God? Is there not someone who has earned the kindness of God? No, David said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to which that I may show the kindness of God? It's a story of grace because though Mephibosheth was wounded, you could say that he found grace in a barren place. In fact, when you talk about the story of Mephibosheth, you're going to see he's a living illustration of the grace of God and the choices that we make that go along with that grace. Now, there's a lot of theological arguments that exist in regard to the topic of grace. It seems to be one of the most misunderstood topics in the religious world today, even some in the church. And that's why we spent about two weeks on this particular topic because I want us to have a great understanding and a great appreciation of what the grace of God really is in our life. And it's amazing how some of these theological debates can all be solved by simple stories that we find within inspired holy writ that show us those individuals who received the grace of God. This morning, I want to take you through the the story of Mephibosheth. I just want to walk you down through 2 Samuel chapter 9. And I want to point out three separate points of emphasis about the grace of God. Here's number one. The grace of God is needful. Now we're all familiar with the question in 2 Samuel chapter 9 in the verse 3 that David asked. He says, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of of God, But how familiar are we with the answer that Ziba gives? Now Ziba was a servant. He was a servant of the house of Saul. And so now he answers the question of David and he says, Well, there's still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. And so the king said, Well, where is he? And Ziba said, Well, he's in the house of Macher, the son of Amiel. And here it is. In low Debar. Now I want you to notice with me and impress upon your mind the answer that Ziba gives for just a moment. David says, is there not still someone of the house of Saul left? Ziba says, yes, there is. He's the son of Jonathan and he's lame in his feet. He never once mentions the man's name. He never once mentions his potential value. He never once mentions any ounce of hope in the situation that Mephibosheth has within his life. Instead he just says... He's lame in his feet. He points out his greatest struggle. Now let me ask you a question. How would you like to be known, not for your name, not for your potential value, not for the hope that may be in your situation, how would you like to be known by your greatest struggle? Hello, this is so-and-so, the thief, the drunkard, the liar, the blasphemer. The insolent person, the sexually immoral, the foul-mouthed. How would you like to be known by your greatest struggle and not what value you may hold? Ziba knew Mephibosheth by his greatest struggle. He's lame in his feet. You see, here's the thing about Mephibosheth. His grandfather was the greatest enemy of David, but his father Jonathan was the greatest friend. To David. And so the Lord chose his king, and that's why Mephibosheth lost everything that he had. He went from the lush palaces of the royals to living in another man's house in a place called Lodabar, where he was crippled or lame 
his entire life. And when he comes before David, he falls prostrate on the ground. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. But I want you to impress upon your mind what Lodabar actually means. The name Lodabar in Hebrew means a place of no pasture or a place of desolation. Lodabar is a place of desolation. Lodabar is a place where one feeds off the crumbs of anger, hate, bitterness, jealousy, wrath, and negative faith. Lodabar is a place of hopelessness, helplessness, and defeat. And here is Mephibosheth, the grandson of a king, the son of a prince, who is living in Lodabar, a place of desolation, far from the lush, lush royal estates that he once knew, and now he is in poverty. But here's the thing about the story of Mephibosheth. He had to leave Lodabar if his feet were ever to grace a better place of purpose and hope. And just as Abraham had to leave out of Ur of Chaldees to go to a better place that God was going to show him, we too must also leave Lodabar, a place of sin, a place of desolation, to be in the heavenly places with our God who will show us all these wonderful blessings that exist in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1 verse 3. Just as the prodigal son left his father's house, found himself in the pig pen of sin, began to smell the bread of home, and worked himself back to his father's house, we too must also leave Lodabar, go back to our father, so that we can experience the great blessings that are in our father's house. But the grace of God is needful in our life because if it were not for... God's grace, my feet would never grace another place of more hope or of greater blessings. And that's heaven. You see, Ziba said, and there's still one of the house of Saul. He's lame in his feet. Here's the amazing part about God's grace. When Ziba saw a problem, David saw a person. That's grace. When Ziba saw a fault and deficiency, David saw a person who needed help. That's grace. When Ziba saw red flags, David found green lights. That's grace. When Ziba saw a handicap, David saw healing. That's grace. When Ziba saw a dirty, emotional, poor, injured man with no hope, David saw a soul that was worth saving. That's grace. And the grace of God is needful in my life because if I'm ever to be known as a Christian, if I'm ever to be known by His name, if I'm ever to be known by His hope, If I'm ever not to be known by my greatest struggle, my greatest fault, and my greatest failure, it will only be because of the grace of God. If my feet are ever to grace a better place of hope, a better place of purpose, a better place of blessing, it will only be because of the grace of God. Number two, the grace of God is meaningful in our life. Notice with me what is said here in verse 5 after David finds out where Mephibosheth is living. David says, he sent and brought out of the house of Machir the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell down on his face and he prostrated himself. And David said, question, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here is your servant. And so David said to him, do not fear. How amazing is this? For I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Here's the amazing thing about the grace of God. You come before God in his throne, an imperfect person because of the sin 
in your life. You seek repentance and you seek his forgiveness. And so you come before God, you fully expect God to deliver the worst judgment that he could possibly deliver upon you. You're worthy of death. But God points you to his son. Jesus the Christ. A sinless Savior dying the death of a sinner of crucifixion for you. The wrath of God, sin being in his body on that cross, bearing our sins, cleansing our sins upon the altar of the cross before God. And God whispers in your ear, Come, eat at my table, and become like one of my sons. There's not a single person in this world, there's not a single person in this room that could ever deserve that statement by my God. You remember what Paul said in Ephesians 2 and verse 5, but God was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We were dead. There was no hope for us. But because of Christ... We have been raised to walk in the newness of life, Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. To have a relationship with our God who loves us despite how imperfect we are. And we ask the question, oh my Lord, oh my precious Lord, why me? And the answer comes ringing down throughout the ages and the answer is this. Because he loves me. No matter how crippled we might be by the excruciating pain and distress of life, where there is grace to be bestowed, there is always a king, and his name is Jesus. There is a king that is seeking to intercede on my behalf. There is a king that scours the ends of the earth to find us desolate in our sin. There is a king that sees what we could be and desires to bring us into his kingdom while everyone around us focuses on what we've done, what we were, and our greatest failures. Jesus sees our greatest potential, what we can be, and the good we can do in the kingdom of God. And regardless of our faults and our failures, we cannot neglect nor forget that there is a king that has shown us grace. And the grace of God is very similar to the grace that David shows to this man by the name of Mephibosheth. Think about it. They both sought to seek and show kindness to another. They both lavished abundance upon someone who did not deserve it. They both bestowed grace upon the merits of another. They both help someone who could not help themselves. We sing a song all the time. Yes, His grace reaches me and will last till eternity. His grace is meaningful to me because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8. His grace is meaningful to me. For Paul said in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we were created by His workmanship in Christ Jesus unto good works, works that were prepared beforehand that we ought to walk in them. His grace is meaningful to me because He showed kindness to me. Because he lavished abundance upon me when I did not deserve it. Because he bestowed grace based upon the merits of another and that was Jesus Christ my Savior. Because he helped someone who could not help themselves. For without Christ, without his blood, and without salvation. I would be destined to spend eternity in a place that was prepared not for me. A place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 7 verse 23. And God says you'll go to that place over my dead body. Over my son's dead body. He died in my place. So that I could be in the place where God is. But number three. The grace of God is impactful. 
Let me show you what I mean. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, starting there in verse 8, when David shows grace to Mephibosheth, he says, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, that your mother's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Have you ever found yourself in a place in life where you feel so down? You feel like you're in a pit that you cannot crawl out of. You feel like someone has thrown you in a well. They've left you to die. You have no ladder to get out of that well. And all you're doing is looking up to the heavens and saying, what is going to happen? I believe that's the attitude of this question that Mephibosheth asks. What have I done that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? You can almost see the shame in his answer. You know what the name Mephibosheth means in Hebrew? From the mouth of shame. You can see the shame of living in the family of an ousted king. You can see the shame of his attitude. You can see the shame of his lameness, his crippling injury. You can see the shame that he has of hiding and living in a place that's called Lodabar, a place of desolation. He lived a life with a full measure of humiliation. But now he's in the court of the king. He's on his knees, prostrate before the most powerful man in all the land, fully expecting for that man to end his life. Yet David brought him to the table. David pours unrestrained and unmerited favor upon this man. He would stay here for life. He would eat as the family of the king eats. His land would be regained. His wealth restored from his fall. And each time Mephibosheth placed his feet under the table of David, his true condition was covered up and he was seen only as the son of a king. David said in Psalm 32 starting in verse 1 Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven whose sin is covered Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit When Mephibosheth sat at the table of the king and his injury, his weakness was covered up. Mephibosheth and his greatest weakness was hidden. When we die to ourselves, to be born again of the water and of the spirit, to rise, to walk in the newness of life, Romans 6 and verse 4, to become a new creation in Christ Jesus, putting away that old man of sin. Our greatest fears, our greatest weaknesses, our greatest failures, and our greatest defeats are hidden with God in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3 and verse 3. And the only worthy response that we could ever give to the grace that has so been abundantly bestowed upon us is obedience. I don't know about you, but the story of Mephibosheth sounds familiar. There was a person who once wrote, I was that Mephibosheth, crippled by my twisted pride and hiding from you in a barren place, a place where you could not find me, a place where you would not give me what I deserved. But somehow you found me and I don't understand why. You called me out of Lodabar and you gave me what I did not deserve. You not only spared my desolate life, but you made it bountiful. And here I am at your table. 
and I will thank you, my king, for I found grace in a barren place. Church, we are Mephibosheth. Slowly walking down the hallway of King David's palace, you hear a clump and a scrape. The sound coming down the hall echoes the dining chamber as it approaches closer to where you're sitting. And once again, you hear a clump and you hear a scrape. And finally, the person opens the door and he slowly shuffles to his seat. And it's the lame Mephibosheth. He's not a son. He's sitting at the king's table. He's not even a member of the royal line. He's a man of grace. And fast forward to the future. God has taken my sin. God has taken my iniquity. God has taken my transgression. He has placed it on a coat hanger by a door never to be put on again unless by my choice. Because he has forgiven me in the abundance and riches of his mercy, of his grace, and of his salvation that can only be found in his son Jesus Christ. And he has called me out of low debar into the throne room of heaven. And there I shall be for all of eternity, casting down my golden crown around the crystal sea in ultimate victory, if I so choose. We are all Mephibosheth. God found us in a desolate place. He gave us abundant mercy and grace. And because of Him, And only him, one day, I can leave this desolate place of sin to live with him for all eternity. God expects and God deserves my obedience. If you're here this morning... And you've yet to be obedient to the gospel plan of salvation to become a child of God. Don't wait. You too can find grace in a barren place. Maybe you find yourself in a place of desolation, a sin. A place of no hope, a place of helplessness. A place where you're feeding off of the crumbs of bitter anger, jealousy, wrath, negative faith. Whatever it is, you too can find that grace. If you're here this morning... You're not a New Testament Christian. You've heard the word of God. The Bible tells us faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. You must believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And you must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. You must be willing to repent of your past sins. That is to turn away from a life of sin that you were in. To live a life for him. That will lead to eternity. Luke 13 verse 3. Jesus said unless you repent. You will all likewise perish. You must be willing to confess his name before men. To say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. It was the confession that the Ethiopian eunuch made in Acts chapter 8. Before he was immersed in baptism to have his sins washed away. Philip said if you believe with all of your hearts you may. And the eunuch said I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And you too must be immersed in baptism to have your sins washed away. The question was once posed to Saul of Tarsus, a man who had done so many horrible things in his life, who had persecuted Christians, persecuted the church, but Ananias, that certain disciple on a street called Straight, told Saul of Tarsus in Acts 22 and verse 16, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And you must live faithful unto him for the remainder of this life. To have a crown of life waiting for you in heaven one day. Revelation 2 and verse 10. 